the great part about this community is that we really are all interested in helping each other learn how to communicate better. And it's that's what I've always loved about podcasting. So I have some tips about interviews that I've gained through uh, my experiences, which I know and I and I expect that you will not necessarily agree with, because um, I think there are a lot of different ways of doing it. This this is the way that I talk about interviewing and the way and some of the things that very simple things that I've learned simply from from what I call stick time from experience from just doing a lot of interviews. So yeah, anyone can can interrupt me at any time, but I've written down a few a few notes um, and I'll just try to go through them quickly and, and make a little bit of sense. One of the thing is from one of those old uh, uh, books on how to better yourself uh, if you want to be heard, listen first. And I, I think that it, I've seen, none of you all probably will be surprised at this, but I've seen many interviewers, interviewers not listen to their interview. And so I, I know it sounds simplistic, but I've seen it happen so many times, um, people simply not listening to the response that they get because they're so ready with the next question. So I actually use a hashtag sometimes, do you listen? Because I just wanna, I'm sort of in favor of people listening really hard. And when when all of us are making podcasts, we're making a, a, an adventure for the ear. I call it a cocktail for the ear. And I think it's really important to think about it in terms of that. And and if you, you know, if, if Rob and I are listening to one of you guys interview, we're going to know if you're thinking and listening and responding correctly. I learned some of this from my daughter who takes debate at the University of Vermont, and you have to listen and answer without writing anything down. And it's really exciting. So I, I apologize. My one tip, and I think that Rob probably disagrees with this, but the one tip I've had from a lot of elevator interviews where I call you up and I say, Kathy, tell me about your business and what your plans are. And then I wait. Um, when I'm preparing for an interview, I don't allow myself more than five words on a piece of paper. Now, I have a lot of clients who come in with reams of paper and they're able to read an interview. I am not able to do that. So I have to look at, you know, Rob or Lisa in the eye and I have to make sure they know that I'm communicating with them and hearing them. That's just one person's solution. And I try to do my research beforehand and know just generally my food groups, if that, <clears throat> sorry, if that makes sense. And if you'll forgive me, um, this is called what I learned from Hot Ones. Has anybody out there watched Hot Ones on YouTube? You were just talking about YouTube, I think. Hot Ones is this, is this stupid show where the host, Sean, eats hot wings with a celebrity. And every hot wing is hotter and every time he asks a question. And if you want, and, and the, the, the only thing that, that I wanna make here is most people don't do simple research, just the bare bones. And this guy, Sean Williams, there are now clips on YouTube of him because all of his interviews from the rap stars to uh, 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 the girl who was in John Wick 3, they all say, how did you know this? How did you find out? I can't believe you know that I did that in high school. You know where he went? He did the basic research that all of you do. He went to Facebook, he went to the prime sources and he read it, he listened and he read those things. You and I could find out any of those things that Sean asked those guests on Hot Ones. The, the people who are on Hot Ones don't think, well, I put it on Facebook or I wrote an article about it. All he's doing is reading the stuff that the person actually posts pretty important. Or uh, what I did in the beginning, I would look up your website. I would look you up on LinkedIn. You guys do all this already. Look you up on Twitter. And then I, I kind of know a little more about you. So did I have any other? Um, uh, I know that that um, that Rob knows this from visiting uh, Podcast Village, soon to become Podville Media yesterday. <clears throat> but I learned from my father a great deal of respect for what I call a sense of arrival. So even when I was just a box in a co-working place, and a table with microphones and no soundproofing, I tried, I realized that I had to start working on that. So I put up small patches of foam that made the um, interviewee feel they were in a recording studio. And I, and then finally I took a wall out and put in soundproof and I built a whole wall of soundproof. And, and what happened is the people who come, they go, ah, now you all know this already. They go, ah, a podcast studio. 
Peter Franchot, the controller of Maryland, was touring this office I had uh, at in Podcast Village 1.0, and he saw the microphones and my partner and I, and he could not possibly sit down fast enough. It was unbelievable, never seen anything like it. His butt was in that seat. We both had a Peter Francho coin in about 16 seconds. Yep, this is it. And then we did an interview because he was obviously ready to sit in front of a microphone. And we published that two hours later and because we, we knew his people would tweet it out. Um, but the sense of arrival I've always felt is extremely important to make you know that this is a place of calm and interview. It could certainly be your house, but I start, I did a couple of my first interviews in my basement. Uh, and, but I think the sense of arrival is extraordinarily important. Um, and another, <laughs> one, one, uh, final thing, Rob, uh, and all of you, I, I remember I had a young lady in to read an intro for one of our podcasts, the launch podcast which was my sort of elevator speech podcast, I would just say, uh, John, tell me about you. And then just try to ask you intelligent questions. And I've looked you up on the website. But I asked this young lady to read the introduction. Welcome to Launch Podcast, blah, 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 blah. And so she read it like this. Welcome to Launch Podcast. And it was the most painful thing. And this is a very young and, and energetic uh, person, still works for the company, he's done very, very well. And I said, Colby, imagine you've had a glass of wine. And she looked at me with desperation in her eyes and she said, can I? <laughs> so uh, at Podcast Village 2.0, we had a fully stocked liquor locker. We don't do that anymore. Uh, sometimes guests insist on it. We did Santana Moss for a few years and he had a red skin mug with a straw in it. And that was full of Tito's vodka. But I don't approve of that and I don't really suggest that, but I told Colby, just try to loosen up, try to take a deep breath, try not to read, just try to be something that's interesting to listen to. So I hope that's not too silly guys, but those I think are all of my points, da da da. Oh, well, uh, and the last one is the one that you guys all know is if you've done five interviews, that's great. And you're probably a starting interviewer, but when you've done 500, you're gonna be, you know, experience in any of these things that you and that we all practice, whether it's a hobby or, or life, is a master. I, I am a, a hack musician, but I've played with my music partner in about 500 retirement homes uh, over the last 10 years. And it's a hell of a good way to get experience, whether you're visiting and chatting or performing or telling a story. Uh, I have gotten so much back from these experiences of small, intimate performances. Again, I know people who go and read poetry there. That experience is something that, honestly, in my opinion, speaking only for myself, I would absolutely not trade. And I would encourage someone who's interested in that. I started out very young going and visiting retirement communities with my high school, and I just kept doing it. And then I partnered up with a friend who performs for about $60 <laughs> in these places. And uh, for a couple of years, we did it three and four or five times a week. And it's, it's made me so much more comfortable than even the interviews that I've done in front of a microphone and you develop the ability to speak with an audience. So uh, I, I just think experience is, and again, not anything that you guys don't know. Those are kind of, I was driving home and trying to uh, think about these Rob and everybody and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I think there are a lot of ways to approach the interview, but I, I think basic research, listening hard, giving your, uh, you know, a glass of water, a cup of coffee, so you're relaxed, I think all, and then even asking your guests to sort of imagine we're outside having a glass of wine and this is an animated conversation because you're writing, you know, something for the ear. Uh, is that helpful? Jump in. One of my questions is this. Let's pretend you're a little bit lazy. Not, of course, not me. I'm not lazy at all. But, but I can see that some people might be. So let's say you're a little bit lazy and you ask your guests to send you a bio. Um, and to send you some questions that they feel that that is around the wheelhouse of the message they're really trying to get out. Uh, sometimes you're working with a subject matter expert, they they literally could have days of information. And so um, to actually encourage them to say, okay, tell me where you want this focus. Go ahead. I have that. I, ha I do that now. In a past life, I was involved in the golf industry. I don't know if any of you guys play golf, but 
um, um, uh, Queenstown Harbor. Anyway, um, as a past board member of one of the of a golf association, I now do what's called <clears throat> the Golf Business Podcast. <clears throat> God help me, and I don't play golf anymore. Um, and they uh, do a combination of that, Rob. It's an excellent question. So I'm doing it. All of you may do this for different organizations. I'm doing it on behalf of an association. So they, they give me my guests. They give me very little guidance, but every third or fourth show, they will send me either uh, a detailed list of what they want. Usually it's one line in a spreadsheet. And sometimes they send me questions. But you have to, the only thing I would say, that's fantastic. If you get that, you just don't always get that, right? If you get a bio and or questions or a vague idea of what they want, that's great. Um, try to say them your, I, again, try to say them in your language, in your body language. When we do audio podcasts, actually, I don't know if you guys do this. When we do audio podcasts over Zoom, I still turn the camera on unless there's a problem with the quality because I need to see you so I can talk to you, so you can see my ridiculous hand gestures uh, and stuff like that. But I do get questions, Rob. I look at them, I read them, I follow them along on a piece of paper where I've edited out as many words as I can. And then I ask them the way I want. Right. That's, right. that's my only advice is if you read those questions, they won't probably sound like they came from you. And then, and then you start down a path, in my opinion, where the interview ends up not being that great. So right. I... I it's got to entertain the ear. It's got to be a conversation at a cocktail party that you're listening and then you really want to listen to. Um, otherwise, I mean, how many boring podcasts have you guys listened to? To my, honestly, I listen to sound quality and if it's interesting and I'll turn it off. I see Lisa's got a question about um, when you have a, a guest that's um, got a lot to say uh, and they get a little bit long winded and, and just 10 seconds from me on that. Uh, before I'm interviewed, because like I've probably been on a thousand podcasts are just 50 of my own. So um, I actually, as a guest, check in with the host before I start and go, whatever question you ask me, I've got a 30 second, a 90 second, a three minute and a 10 minute answer. What, what are you looking for from me? And uh, because it's their rhythm and some of them will say 10 and it's like, okay. You know, then I'm training, but okay. Um, some will say three, got it. And I keep sort of, a, I call it a communication shot clock. I only bring that up because as, a, as a, a lousy host, I do tell my people before we start, you know, as I'm calming them down, one quick question. Um, I'd like, and for me, I'd like it to be a conversation. So um, you might see me signal you, but, it, you know, once we get to about 90 seconds, two minutes or so, I might give you the high sign just so I can poke at it a little bit. And so we can go back and forth, but I establish those rules. Charlie, what do you think? Uh, uh, Rob, you're absolutely right. The only thing I can add to that um, is is just um, people would ask me for launch podcast, how long is this? And I would tell them, this is only as long as our conversation is interesting. Because that, that show could be, I could do whatever I wanted with that show. It was a freebie as my rent. So I, I could be five minutes long or 50 minutes long. Now, 50 minutes is horrifying. It's too long for an elevator interview. But I would say, we're only going to talk until I think we're interesting. And when we're not interesting, I literally turn the microphones off. Now, that's a very sort of a strange way of, of adding on to Rob's thing. But again, I'm trying to make it interesting to listen to. So if that interview E goes on for 10 minutes, right. I'm not going to want to listen to it. And the audience is not going to want to listen to it. So to, to answer the question, I think if the person's going on and they can't be stopped, I will interrupt them. And that's why we don't always do live folks. So we could even let that guy go on and then just cut it in post. So I think there's a couple of ways of dealing with it. It's a great question though, because it happens to, to everyone, I'm sure in this, in this room. If I can sort of tie in, you know, what I write about and teach about is sales, not podcasting. So you get me on a sales topic and, and, and that one I feel good about. And, and a good salesperson, I can spend three days with a sales team. The trick is not the first question. It's the two or three follow-up questions. And the, and the reason why that takes more skill than people can appreciate is because you can write the first question down. The second one is processing, listening, and, and sometimes it's just the word and, or it's, huh, but, or tell me more about that. But that's where the mental agility um, is required. But to me, that's where the, the, the interview really kicks in 
into gear. And so that's why I don't want my guests going five minutes and saying, I call it with sales, a hit and spray. I don't know what you want. I'll give you five, six responses to it. One of them ought to make you happy. That's not the way I want to sell. And that's not the way I want to interview. So sometimes we have to help our guests that way.